Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Silence Marsh. I'm a PhD student at Stony Brook University and a 2024 junior fellow for the Electoral Integrity Project. And I'm delighted to be the chair for panel 11 on electoral systems and institutions. Um, just to lay the groundwork, presentations today will be between 10 and 15 minutes. Um, I will be keeping track and I will message each participant at the 13 minute mark with a two minute warning during their presentation to ensure adequate time is given to each of the panelists. Um, after everyone has finished presenting, I will turn it over to the discussant, Anna Unger, where she will share some thoughts and comments on the presentations. Um, throughout the presentation, I will also monitor the chat for any questions or comments that come up um, and can be addressed during the Q&A section at the end. Um, I encourage you to use the chat if you wish. Otherwise, there will be an opportunity for you to raise your hand at the end of the panel as well. Um, so we will go in order of the program, beginning with Melissa Rogers um, on their paper, Measuring Electoral Access at the Local Level. So I'll pass it over to you, Melissa. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Silence, and uh, thank you everyone uh, for being here. So um, my name is Melissa Rogers. I am Associate Professor of, of actually Comparative Politics at um, Claremont Graduate University, though today I'm presenting on American politics um, and our, our work recently on um, local level elections and local level election access. So the background of this project is that um, my colleagues and I have been working a lot uh, really the origin was with working with um, Native American voting rights within the United States. And one thing, so, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of barriers, especially to Native Americans on reservations, accessing the ballot, especially due to, due to rurality and other issues of systemic discrimination. One thing we, we kept coming against is challenges of local level election administration. And, you know, the, the experience being very different when the researchers were trying to vote in LA County or San Diego County like myself and having no issue, right? So it's, it's quite easy to register, you know, the, the election um, system is, you know, I get it ma mailed to me, no problem. I can, I can also vote within a mile, no problem. But for Native Americans, they were facing many, many obstacles, especially in sort of, um, Parts of the, the the of states that were were not so interested in Native American populations accessing the ballot, and so what we started to think was that we really needed a, a local level uh, measure of electoral access, um, and and whether the voter can easily access the ballot, but done so at the local level. So most all almost all research, at least in the United States. Uh, on this question has been done at the state level. And so we're introducing this very large data collection process at the local level. So we're, we're, the motivating question is about electoral equity and whether people can access the ballot. And something that I'm sure everyone knows is that the, the US electoral system uh, different. So everything's done um, subnationally, right? At the state level, um, as well as the local level. And a lot of research has focused on the state level, but uh, but not as much on, on the local level. And what we've seen in the in recent years is a really a, a, a real bifurcation of our electoral systems by state. So some states have just you know, done everything they can to make voting as easy as, as possible within reason, right? So mail to your house, right? You, know, uh, you can vote a month ahead of time, you can clear your ballot, all this sort of stuff. And a bunch of other states have gone the opposite direction, right? So eliminating early voting, you know, requiring ID, which in other countries wouldn't be so hard, but it can be quite hard in the US, right? And requiring any mail-in ballot to be received by election day, some of these other things that make voting very difficult, right? So, you know, we're, we're in this environment, we're looking at um, the, the local level election. In the US, this mostly means the county level. And what we're doing is doing a very large data collection process to see, you know, with a battery of different questions to see, you know, is this possible in this county? Is it possible in that county? Is it possible in that county? Ultimately, with the project, what we want to do is develop a multi-level model or a multi-level indicator of, of state level or of voting at both the state and the local level, because the state 
st structures a lot of the, the laws around elections, but the local level has a, does a whole lot in terms of administration to make things different, different. So we could say at the local level, you know, based on both the state law and the local level administration, this local level is easy to access or hard to access. In this particular paper, we focus on the county level um, at this moment, or the local level, most of which is county. Um, and you know, having surveyed the literature, there's not a lot of work on the counties uh, or a lot of measurement at the county level in broad scale because there's over 5,000 counties and some states do it by at a different measure, um, level than the county like Michigan, where they, so you're looking at 6,000 units that you have to collect data on. And that this is why a lot of people haven't done this sort of thing. So we're, we're undertaking this large data collection process. So these features of US elections, I've already gone through a couple of, the, a couple of them. You know, most it's the, the constitution gives elections uh, to the states. And so there's a huge variation, how you can vote, when you can vote, uh, you know, the, what it was needed to vote. The control of administration itself for elections is at the local level, usually the county level. And there's a, uh, but there's a big deal of variation state to state and the degree of county level control. You know, some states are more centralized, some are more decentralized. And counties though have a lot of tools at their disposal to make voting easier or they may not. And counties are sometimes more resourced than others because it's up to the states. Some states spend a lot on election administration, others do not, right? And so sometimes counties are very resource constrained. Um, and, you know, that every county, um, every election, local level election administrator will complain that they, they don't have the funding that they need. Right? And, and so, you know, that all of these things go, in, uh, go into the, the administration elections, so, some of which, you know, in some places quite difficult. So the, our argument is essentially that the cost of voting may vary greatly, not only depending on the state, but also depending on the county. Right. And because the, the county um, determines uh, the ease of registration and voting. And so you're, we're seeing a lot of variance across these places. So, you know, there's existing measures of equity, of voting equity at the state level, right? So there's a few different indicator, indicators of that, you know. Um, and so what we're doing, trying to do is add a county level indicator and doing so from the perspective of the voter, right? So from the perspective of the voter, how hard is it for me to cast a ballot if I intend to? And the way that we're doing it is we're mostly having undergraduate research assistants conduct both web searches of the variables I'm about to describe and making phone calls to 5,000 plus county level officials asking information about, you know, is, is uh, information about registration available at the, the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles? Is it available, you know, at the social services office, right? So is, are these pamphlets available in Chinese, right? We, we are asking those sort of questions. And you know the the partisan environment or the, the the kind of controversy around elections in the United States right now makes this quite difficult because you know the the county level official receiving the the, the call is often skeptical, right? Or is concerned that that our research assistants are calling to sort of you know say that elections aren't real or they you know they're fraudulent, right? And and really what they're trying to do is figure out this information for us. So it's a it's a challenging role for our undergraduate assistants, but we at any given time have uh, five to 10 research assistants working, you know, uh, 10 hours a week or so trying to collect this information on ease of registration and voting, availability of drop boxes, language support, as, and, and we have our, already collected all the, de the um, um, details on sociodemographics because our model, our ultimate model of, of the cost of voting is going to also include demographic level indicators. So I'm going to race through these summary variables, but, it, you know, but um, there's a whole a bunch of sub variables we have in within each. So we're looking at registration information, right? So can you get registration information at Department of Motor Vehicle offices, social services offices? Is it available on the radio? Is it available in minority oriented media? Um, is the information provided in minority languages? Similarly, can you get voting information this way? Right. And, you know, do you, how can you find out wh whether where the poll locations are, whether they're open or whether closed, what time you now are the drop boxes we're, you know, there's we have this whole battery of, of questions that we're having our our, um, our uh, research assistants collect. Right. So we're also looking at how easy it is to register. Right. How many days before what, what do you need to register these types of things, as well as drop boxes. 
um, things such as mail service, right? So um, for for me and San Diego, we I obviously have mail service to my house and there's no problem. I receive my ballot, I send it out from my home. But for Native Americans on reservations in Arizona and Nevada, they can't in a lot of cases. They don't receive standard mail service and they live you know, 40 to 100 miles away from either a polling place or a, a, a post office with standard mail service, you know, it's, it can be quite difficult. So we're trying to code some of these things, um, as well as the resources that counties have for elections, right? So whether the state is giving them money, how much money they're giving them, whether there's the support for voting equipment, the, these types of things, as well as these sociodemographic the census variables that we know, in, you know, go into the cost of voting, income, education, these sort of things, uh, mobility status, health status. So we, we've we've completed now five states, but we've only run pilot data on two. So we started with Arizona and Nevada, in part because they have relatively few counties. You know, some some states like Wisconsin has 80, you know, they have 80, 90 counties and um, the, we, we didn't want to start with those where Nevada and Arizona have 10, 15 counties a piece. Uh, we're, we are also finished with Wisconsin, with um, Minnesota, with Georgia. We're working on South Dakota and Pennsylvania and, and uh, Michigan now. And we in, we in part liked the contrast between Nevada and Nevada and Arizona because at the state level, Nevada is considered a low cost of voting state. They have a, a state constitutional right to, to vote. Um, and in the state level indicators, they have a, a, like a very low cost of voting according to these state level indicators. Arizona is, is a pretty high cost of voting state, kind of in the middle, bottom middle. So we like this contrast as well. And given our interest in Native American politics, these are two states with substantial Native American populations. So that, that was a, a personal interest to us. So we collected all county level variables for these two states. And then we created an index, right? So it, it, we, at this point, we have an additive level um, index. We've scaled everything, made it zero to one um, to make it interpretable um, uh, for, to, for cross comparison. So, you know, what we find is that actually, once we look at the county level, Arizona and Nevada are fairly similar, even though we get different values at the state level. And part of this is is about the fact that in Aaron in Nevada in particular, almost everyone lives in Las Vegas or Reno um, and to some extent Carson City. And so if you have good election administration in Vegas and Reno, then that's most of the state. Right. And so from a population perspective, you know, the things go well in, in, um, in Las Vegas and Reno. And so for, you know, when we do the population weighted score, Nevada is much better than Arizona, right? But when you look at the full breadth of the counties and all the different counties, they're not so different when you're not factoring in population. Uh, but so they have about the same mean across the counties, not, accounting, uh, not uh, including population, but the, the standard deviation uh, varies. The, the median is quite different and we have a, a much bigger swing in Nevada. We have some really poorly performing counties in Nevada, um, uh, even though Nevada is, as a whole, the state does fairly well. And then we went through, we ranked them. For the most part, you have more urban counties doing uh, better, uh, but not exclusively. So if you have, for example, Maricopa County is Phoenix, which is a, a very large percentage of the population. That does very well. But at the same time, Pima County, which is Tucson, which is the second largest city, doesn't do so well, according to our indicators. And we have a couple of fair, uh, relatively, so uh, Greenlee County is relatively rural, but actually performs very well. But for one of the things we care about is this Native American population and Apache County, for example, um, which is, you know, uh, at the Navajo Nation as well as Navajo County don't do as well. Similarly in Nevada, so Clark County is Las Vegas, does very well. That's the highest, uh, the best election administration we have in, in these two states. Carson City does very well, Washoe is Reno. So the urban uh, centers of Nevada, and Nevada is the most urban concentrated state in the United States, right? So the, the, it's the state where the, the most people concentrated in just one or two urban areas. And so almost all the population lives in these three areas and they do very well on our indicators. But once you get out to rural areas in Nevada, they do not perform well at all, um, according to our indicators of, of electoral access. And some of these, you know, so and most of these are quite rural um, and also have very large um, either Hispanic or um, Latinx or um, Native American populations in the in the worst performing of our 
of our states. Uh, one one thing that um, we, you know, for our purposes, the native population is strongly associated with poor electoral equity in these states. Well, we'll see if that's true once we open up the, um, the sample a bit larger, right? But uh, for the most part, we don't see, say, the Black population share or the Hispanic population share being negatively associated. And that's because in Arizona and Nevada, there's a large degree, the, the Black population and, and, the, and the Hispanic population tends to live in the urban areas that have very good access. Okay, and then um, I'm almost done, but... Uh, so um, we did a case study of Elko, Nevada, right? So again, Nevada is a very well, good performing state um, overall, but we've done some research in Elko County, which is where they have the Duck Valley Reservation and the, the state at various points. Uh, so the state has been quite supportive of providing more electoral access, but the county has said, okay, we can't have voting booths on Native American reservations, right? You know, they... They did everything. They, they went to court to try to stop from uh, providing access uh, for Native Americans who live, you know, 60 to 100 miles from the next voting booth. And they, they went to court to try to uh, to get um, to stop from providing electoral access to Native Americans on the Duck Valley Reservation. So then they, they ended up settling, putting a, a, um, a voting booth on Duck Valley. But then when the time came, the the constitutionalist sheriff from Elko County refused to pick up the ballots. From, um, from the reservation. And so the Nevada Secretary of State actually had to send state troopers to get the ballots out of, um, out of the reservation and bring it to, to the, the, the polling place or the, 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 where they're counting the ballots. And so there's just a lot of variation that we're trying to highlight of, uh, at the local level. And hopefully you know, next, next step steps this goal of 50 states in the next three years. And the data set will be free and available to researchers, government officials, activists, um, and the hope is in the long term to incorporate these state level variables uh, to, get, to get a multi-level um, idea of, of the different um, access at the local level. And that's it. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Melissa, for your work on such an important topic. As someone who worked as a county election administrator in Minnesota for a number of years, I was very excited to see this paper on the panel. Um, as your paper emphasizes, counties have such a significant impact on shaping the voter experience. So for that reason, um, it has such key importance to the broader narrative. So thanks for your research on that. Thank you so much. That's um, awesome. uh, next, I will turn it over to Rushdie Nakardi um, from the International Foundation for Electoral Systems to present the paper, An Introduction to Effective EMB Leadership Transitions. Thank you, Silence. And greetings to everybody. Uh, recognizing it's a Friday and we're standing between you and your weekend. Uh, we'll try and kind of move this along. Um, IFAS has been looking at the issue of um, support to EMB leadership since 2019 when we did a, a pretty big research paper and we've we've actively been looking to support uh, election practitioners in particular those kind of at the executive level over the past couple of years and with our training program that we nicknamed IXL. Um, we've been training more than uh, 500,000 people across the globe. Um, something which has stood out for myself and my colleagues, Stefan Darnolf, both of us work in the training and electoral operations department here at IFAS, um, was the fact that not a lot has been actually done in this particular area looking at um, the transition which actually happens at EMB leadership kind of level. So for this presentation, I'm going to cover roughly four areas, which is also in the paper. Um, why transitions matter? What's the current state um, of transitions? What are some of the factors impacting transitions? And what are some of the priority areas? This is very much a nascent area of work, and we are hoping to build on this quite a lot. Um, for us as an institution, we are very lucky in that we have a global footprint. And so we've been able to draw on uh, discussion surveys, surveying our country offices and been able to kind of draw some inspiration from them as well as speaking to a number of other either senior EMB officials or looking at documentation, build, building on our other work around strategic planning and so forth. So what, to jump into the first area, why transitions matter and kind of using a bit of a, a story, I'm going to try and kind of shape this, this picture. 
In January this year, um, India was well on track to actually hold its election. Its election was going to kick off in April. India runs the biggest uh, elections in the world. It's a multi-week kind of event uh, covering millions of voters and using electronic voting and so forth. India typically, well, India has by law a three-person executive that consists of a chief commissioner, and you see all three of them in the picture at the moment. Uh, chief commissioner in the center, um, to the left of him, um, Commissioner Satish Pandey and Commissioner Arun Gul. Um, so bear in mind, this was in January. With elections happening in April, there was one a planned retirement of one commissioner, which took place in February 2024. In March 2024, one month and literally weeks before the election date was announced and about a month before the actual election started taking place, there was a shock resignation of the other commissioner, which kind of left a single commissioner, the chief commissioner in charge of, um, for a very short space of time of the elections. It threw up massive questions whether the Electoral Commission of India would be ready to actually run this election, how disruptive would this be, all of these kinds of things. And it kind of paints this picture about how critical it is to actually be looking at this issue of executive transitions. So some of the vulnerabilities which actually come up, and I put on the left-hand side of the screen some um, uh, image just kind of showing how the, the the number of registered voters in India is more than, than the kind of top seven other elections which are happening in the world this year. Um, and we, we're looking at 11 million civil servants of some kind, polling officials and so forth, having to administer this election. And suddenly you have this change happening at the very top of the, the institution. Somebody coming into a position and, and uh, um, the president appointed in a very short space of time uh, replacement commissioners, and there's been lots of controversy about the process and so forth. But coming in, a new commissioner doesn't know the organization, doesn't know the scale and scope, and has to organize an election like a month or, um, into the future. They've not had a chance to develop any kind of solid working relationships or personal support systems within this particular sphere of election administration. Maybe they come from the public service and they have that in other spaces. There's a pressure to kind of navigate in the Indian case, a high risk electoral event. And we saw kind of the, the coalition government that more or less came out of that um, with lots of expectations emanating around the credibility of the, the not just the institution, but the process itself. Um, there's a need to kind of build networks and coalitions as somebody in the executive kind of position to look at issues of reform, what the institutional culture is and so forth. And that's not just internally, but externally as well. And then lastly, if you're coming from outside of the electoral institution, you need to kind of navigate the pressures and the complexity of organizing elections. Um, and here we talk about this interplay between various critical principles around transparency, independence, integrity, and so forth. So you're still getting your feet wet. You have to run an election. Um, and for us, kind of focusing on why it's important to kind of have the, the level of support for transitions kind of covers a number of diff different areas. One, you want to limit the likelihood of, of derailment or disruption of any kind of electoral activity. You want to speed up time to perform and deliver a better election than what you potentially might have come into. Um, if you are grooming somebody who's coming from inside in the institution, if that is an option, I mean, you want to be able to retain that scarce talent and know-how, recognizing that a lot of what we know about elections, we learn on the job, and there are very few areas where we can actually go and study how to actually be uh, election administrator. That That is changing, um, and there are new opportunities arising, but it's still very much a field where you kind of learn on the job. They potentially, depending on the nature of the transition, there might be a need to accelerate the needed organizational change. Maybe it, when we look at things like the introduction of technology, maybe in elections in places like Georgia and so forth that have upcoming elections that will be using new technologies, 
or need for reforms, um, depending on the nature of the transition and what initiated the transition. And lastly, I mean, I think the biggest one is to kind of mitigate the risk to the electoral institution and the process. Nowadays, we talk a lot about how to restore, retain, retain trust in the democratic process and elections in particular. And so this these become critical variables that, that kind of underpin the importance of support when it comes to transitions. So what are the current state of transitions when we looked across the globe. And we I'll pick on two specific elements. The first one is what are the reasons for the transition? Is it a sudden, is it a foreseen transition where there's a retirement on the way, such as what we saw in the one Indian commissioner? We, we know that somebody's tenure is coming to an end. It's pretty orderly. There's a because of the lead time, somebody's able to actually um uh, announce that end of tenure uh, coming up. And we see that in countries like Australia, for example, where the current Australian electoral commissioner has announced his departure from the, that he will not seek a renewal of tenure more than a year out from the end um, when, when his tenure is due. Um, then you have the situation of sudden change and sudden change can stem from illness. It could come from scandal. Uh, it could come from dismissal, or as we also saw in India, voluntary resignation. Catching everybody unawares, it's, it usually initiates some form of crisis within the institution, and there's often no time in terms of um, how you prepare for this. So that's the first kind of element to, that we thought is really critical when it comes to transition. The second one is what is the nature of the executive structure? And in our work that we kind of been looking around the globe, we, we kind of came up with three three models. And this is something which obviously, I mean, as we do more work in this, we'll be tweaking how this actually works. But we came up with three kind of structures. One, you've got electoral management bodies that have either a single head or a troika, kind of like in the case of India, um, as well as what you see in places like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, the UK, and places like Mauritius as well, where you have a single commissioner at the top um, and poss possibly one or two deputies kind of forming that troika. They often come with a long history from within the public service and are often seasoned uh, civil servants who have either held high-ranking positions in other departments. What we then saw are two other um, components or structures that are very similar. Both of them multi-member kind of structures where you have five or more people um, leading the institution. But what we found distinct was that in some cases they come from multiple sectors, so a multi-origin kind of uh, 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 sourcing of uh, commissioners that might come out of the health sector, engineering, um, uh, public service, the judiciary. And then you've got another one, which is also multi-member, but they come out of a single sector. And that might be, for example, mainly the judiciary. And that's what we often see in the Latin American kind of electoral management bodies like Brazil, Costa Rica, Guatemala, El Salvador. And up until recently, Honduras had a model like that. The multi-member, multi-origin kind of model is seen in many, many different countries and often the kind of newer democracies that we see around the world, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Pakistan, Mexico, Zambia, South Africa, Armenia, just to kind of mention a few. And just to kind of distinguish again, I mean, the in the single origin one, almost all of the commissions are drawn out. Uh, and driven out of the judiciary. And there's this tremendous amount of control when it comes to the judicial model. Some of the characteristics, um, and this speaks to some of the challenges when it comes to transition as well, for single or troika kind of uh, member entities, they've got a small leadership team, they're not always tenure limited, and so they could renew their tenure several times over. Um, they generally season public servants, as I've mentioned. The accountability is quite contained in a small structure. If you're having one person or three people, they're the primary decision makers, and decision making in that kind of entity is often seen or perceived to be pretty decisive and very effective. But what we've seen as well is that Drawing people from the public service, they're not necessarily independent from political leadership. And that is a skill set that 
in an election uh, management kind of uh, context is pretty critical. Some of the other weaknesses, there's some vulnerability and bias um, because you've got such a small decision-making entity and governance is pretty precarious, especially if somebody falls ill or they're not available, you start sitting with issues of quorums and decision-making that's standing still for a period of time. On the multi-member, larger team, uh, same with the judicial kind of uh, model, they're coming from a diverse sector of society, they might be tenure limited for one or two terms, similar to, um, in the judicial model. Um, there's a broader technical skill set, greater diversity of experiences. Um, what we, for example, found in the single model is in a country like New Zealand, they're struggling with uh, uh, expertise around um, information technology or disinformation or information uh, integrity, whereas in that kind of skill set might well exist in a multi-member model greater spread of the roles, um, but you are looking at longer decision-making lead times. You are looking at much more complex consensus seeking. Where And what could help is when you have staggered term limits. The judicial model, significant array of power when it comes to rulemaking, implementation, and rule adjudication. There's definitely legal rigor uh, and a hyper-transparency when it comes to the way that they work. Um, in some places, similar to um, the kind of multi-member, multi-origin model, you have limited tenure as well. Um, but as we've seen in places like Honduras, uh, there has been a perceived lack of accountability because of this power concentration of rulemaking, implementation, and adjudication in one entity. Um, something which we've also learned, judges don't stop being judges. Um, while they take on this new job as being an electoral commissioner, they're often keeping their eye on their old jobs, which they might return to at the end of their tenure in places like uh, um, um, Brazil, you might be on a two year tenure only and you're kind of looking at um, what's happening in your kind of old job as a seasoned kind of professional. Um, and therefore, it makes acclimatizing to the new context potentially very hard um, or harder. Uh, especially when it comes to the rulemaking and implementation, not so much on the adjudication side of things. What are some of the factors that that um, impact transitions? And here we kind of look at two areas. Um, transition provisions are often coded in law, um, especially when it comes to issues of recruitment. Um, for single member, it's often highly centralized by a government ministry and is often seen to be easier to fill. For multi-member, multi-origins, much more complex kind of recruitment. You're looking at parliaments often being involved, recommendations going, going to the presidency, and it's a longer period of filling positions. Uh, for the multi-member single origin, the kind of judicial model, the judicial the judiciary often control the recruitment, and they often look at the rotation model. Um, and this is hey, what... Rusty, you have just about 30 seconds left. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, let me talk very briefly then about uh, just the in the need, the need for kind of special provisions, because this is something which we find is not really common. Um, there needs to be a kind of provision where we look at interim roles, continuing roles for outgoing kind of uh, positions, short-term appointments. Um, and I've mentioned a number of different countries. We have seen places like um, uh, Kenya, Nigeria, where long there is a long-term risk when it comes to certain um, where, where vacancies are not being filled. Um, lastly, I'll just kind of um, talk about critical lessons. We need more regulatory frameworks which actually talk to um, transitions. We need active written down plans. We need strategic communication kind of models. We need to we have we need stronger teams, and we need to be look beyond briefing books where we look at coaching and mentoring kind of models and then carefully look at the kind of timing of transitions. I won't get into this, but these are some of the critical priority areas that, that incoming um, uh, executives need to look at, the strategic plan, issues of electoral crisis and national security. It's a complex area of work. 
often overlooked, understudied within the elections field. Um, it's an area that we're needing to do a lot more work on, and IFAS intends to explore more of this in the in the future. Thank you for that. Great. Thanks, Rusty, for sharing these valuable insights on the important executive leadership um, transition guidance. Um, next is Yasmin Kalmet with us today. Oh, not seeing her. Okay. In that case, we can transition to David Alyasano from Florida International University on the paper, The Impact of Electoral Law Reforms on Voters' Turnout in Sub-Saharan Africa Countries. Hi, good morning from this part of the world. My name is David Olusenjo. I'm sorry I have a techn and technological glitches with my video. So I'm sorry I'm not able to fix the video. So please pardon me what I present without the video. So the part of my research is the impact of electoral law reform on voters turnout in sub-Saharan Africa. So, I'm in Nigeria, I'm like in West Africa, and I'm, my, I'm equally a second year PhD student at Florida International University, Miami, Florida. So my topic again is electoral law reform and voters turnout. I'm trying to assess, I mean, there have been across West Africa, across so different regions in Africa, the various forms of electoral reform in the region, Written from easy, I mean, from introduction of the modal voting system to easy electoral voting and like finance bill to so the biggest and timers electoral reform in Africa. So I'm trying to assess the impact of this electoral law reform on the voters turnouts in Africa to see if this, I mean, introduction of new bills or electoral reform to ease accessibility of voting increase or decrease voters turnouts in sub-Saharan Africa. So this image represents a voters accreditation process in Nigeria. And the other one on my left, it shows voters turnouts in Zambia. Here's an example of turnouts in, in Zambia. So I'm trying to see if this electoral law reform is increases or decreases voters turnouts across diverse sub-regions in Africa. So my exact question, so I'm trying to ask if electoral law reform influence voters turn out in sub-Saharan Africa countries, or if they are just, I mean, ineffective or inactive in the region. So how does electoral law reform influence voters turn out in sub-Saharan African countries? And again, my hypothesis, I'm trying to hypothesize that electoral law reforms that include easy registration of voters and reducing barriers to political participation leads to increased voters turnout in sub-Saharan African countries. So I, I mean, measure my electoral law reform with easy accessibility of voters. That's those, I mean, laws that were introduced. So I, I could have used other variable, the other variable that I could use to measure electoral law reform. But in this case, in my research, I adopt easy registration of voters as my measurement to measure electoral law reform in Africa. And my such objective is to examine the relationship between electoral law reforms and voters' turnouts and to identify the key factors influencing voter decision to participate or abstain from voting in West Africa and sub-Saharan African countries. So this is the organization of my research from introduction to background to literature review, to methodology, analysis, results, conclusion. So this is how I organize my research and my paper. So this is my main argument. My main argument is that the purpose of this research is to investigate the impact of electoral law reform on voters' turnouts. And I define electoral law reform are often undertaken to enhance democratic process, ensure fairness, and to increase participation in the election. However, the effectiveness of this reform in achieving 
on house and book us on a human claim, particularly in the context of Southern Africa. So I'm trying to see if this electoral law reform, if they have been effective in terms of ensuring increased voters turn out or the increased voters turn out in the region. So the previous society been unclear on whether electoral law reform increased voters turn out. So this study aims to fill the gap by examining the relationship between electoral law reforms and voters turnouts in sub-Saharan African countries. And again, the central argument is that electoral law reforms that include biometric voter registration and verification system to enhance the integrity and efficiency of election leads to increase voters turnout in sub-Saharan African countries. So this overview of my literature, literature review on election and voter turnout in Africa, I define electoral law reform and voter turnout. Also, I try to assess or explore the relationship between electoral law reforms and voter turnout in Africa, and I try to elaborate on the goals and motivation behind this reform. So for my cases, I selected among this according to um, Udax in 2022, it stated that about 25 African countries have either or already implemented or plan to implement a biometric voting system. So these 25 countries include from Zimbabwe, this spread across sub-Saharan African countries, from Kenya to Liberia to Lesotho to Senegal to Angola. So this, I mean, argument dictates my cases. I have about 25 sub-Saharan African countries, but half of these 25 countries is not all that have laws to back up the electoral reform. And I try to like look at those among these 25 countries that they have laws to back up this reform, I mean, this production of reform. And out of these 25 countries, I have about 12. This is my research, my finding that they have laws to back up this reform. So, I mean, investigate this argument that about 25 countries have introduced electoral law reform. And of these 25 countries, 12 among them have laws to back up electoral law reform in sub-Saharan Africa. So these 12 countries include Uganda, Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, Namibia, Togo, DR Congo, Zambia, Cameroon, Syria, Lord, and Niger. And these are the, I mean, these are the laws in various countries to back up this electoral law reform in this region. And um, before this, before this reform, there have been like many elections that have been held across these countries. So I try to see, I mean, the pre-election and post-election to see if this electoral law reform increased voters turnout in the region. So after this election, and I try to look if those countries, if they held at least one election after the electoral law reform, if they if they held at least one election to see to see if this reform has had an impact or has been effective in the post electoral law reform, in the, in the election that was held after the reform was introduced. So these three steps are African countries have a lot of these effects. And so this will allow me to compare rates of voters on house before and after the introduction of reform and to control for other factors at the macro level. So my data is a panel data, it's an unbalanced panel data. By, un by unbalance, I mean the years are not consistent because it's a periodic election. So some, some of these countries hold election after every four years, some other after every five years. So if my panel, my, I mean my panel data is not a balanced one, like a consistent year, it's a unbalanced panel data. So it's for the three countries I have. So the unshaded years represent the pre-election, those elections that were held before electoral law reform were introduced, and those shaded portion, they, they represent the elections that were held after the electoral law reform were introduced in order to see if this reform increased voters turnouts in the post-election, in the election that were held after the reform were introduced. So for Cameroon, Cameroon had about four elections before the introduction of the electoral law reform and had one election after the reform was introduced and also across other countries from Cameroon to Zimbabwe. So I try to see if this reform has been effective in these countries. So again, the unshaded portion represents the pre 
reform why the shaded portion they represent the post reform. So I, I have to lines ordinarily square, given that my dependent variable is an interval or a continuous variable. So I, I have to lines the ordinarily square, and I use total stone house as my dependent variable to measure the impact of this stone house. And my main or explanatory variable is electoral law reform, and this is a binary variable. So I'm going to show in the next slide how I measure this variable. And this is my control variable, presidential electoral formula, incumbent, whether it whether the incumbent or the president person in office, whether the person contests for election or not, and the time of sequencing, perhaps if the election were held concurrently and not concurrently, I mean with the legislative election and the presidential election, if they are held at the same time or they are held on different dates. And also, I, I try to look at the impact of corruption. Perhaps if corruption might probably increase turnout, turnout buying, if perhaps if the turnout would have been influenced by both turnout buying or like exchange of money or gifts to increase the electoral turnout. So that's why I try to like, I mean, account for whether corruption could have increased turnouts in the region. So these are the list of variables that constitute my, I mean, my measurements. So again, I measure turnout as number of votes over the voting age population. And this is the source of my data from Institute for Electoral Democracy and an Assistance Idea. And my procedure formula, I try to see if, ele if the election is based on plurality or majoritarian election. I mean, if the election was, I mean, majoritarian means if the election is held once, and the plurality of election, like at least more than 50% of the votes. So that is why I try to measure the presidential formula they use. So if uh, no elite, no like candidates and major got able to get about 50% of your votes, they have to go for a second one off to see, to just have the just to have the majority of the votes. So this is this is presidential formula and it's a dummy variable. So plurality is coded to zero and majority is coded to one. And I have electoral reform, which is called a binary or a dummy variable. I coded that the experience of reform as one and absence of reform as zero. And time and sequencing of the election, whether it's concurrent or non concurrent election, by concurrent, I mean whether the presidential election and the legislative election were held on the same day or whether they are held on different dates. So that could have probably influenced the outcome or the turnout of the election. And I call it a measure the incumbents, whether the incumbents compete for election. And this also is a binary or a dummy variable. And corruption per output affects or measure corruption perception index, which is equally a continuous variable. And the region across Africa. So I have about four or five sub region in Africa. We have Eastern Africa, Western Africa, Southern Africa, Central Africa. So that the five sub region in Africa. So this is a polycotton poly variable. So this represents the descriptive nature of my data. This is the descriptive type of variable included in the, in the analysis. So I have about I mean, 75 cases for, my, for all the elections that were held in these 12 countries, both pre and post election. So I have about 25 and 75 elections spread across these 12 countries. So this represents the descriptive nature of my data. So this is percentage of total turnouts across these 12 countries. So I have from Cameroon to Zambia to Zimbabwe. So this percentage of total turnouts in various sub-Saharan African countries. Again, this shows the percentage of voters turnouts in this sub-region just to represent pictorially how many the turnouts just have an idea of the sense or the outcome of the turnouts in this different sub-region of Africa. So having done my analysis, I did my bivariate analysis and a multivariate regression. And so unfortunately for me, I mean, none of my variable is, I mean, my, I think I'm not able to get my hypothesis. My hypothesis was not supported. And so my, this shows that the impact of electoral law reform on voters to not is negative. And it doesn't, it didn't increase 
I mean, those reforms that we introduced did not increase voter turnout in, in sub Saharan African countries. And also, the impact of presidential electoral reform, I mean, the presidential electoral formula was equally negative. It showed that this is not equally statistically significant. So I don't have a substantive interpretation for this because it's not statistically significant. But also the time and sequences, and of course, other variable I have as well. So it should have known my variable is, I mean. Hi, David. There are about 30 seconds remaining. Okay. Thank, thank you so you. much. So I, I so given a, like empirical analysis, so I had to like did, I had to do duplicated cases to show what could account for this because for, I mean the impact of electoral law reform on the past on house and based on my qualitative cases aside from my quantitative analysis, I did the qualitative cases in Nigeria, Zambia, and Kenya and it showed that during the election that we held after the election there was so much intimidation, there was so much harassment and like because of like management of the election by the electoral management bodies, we are not effective in terms of organizing the election. So this actually reduced, so there was reduced or reduction in turnout in turn after the reform we introduced. So this, this, I mean, this is my presentation. It's still an ongoing research. So thank you so much for listening and I appreciate for listening. Thank you so much. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Fascinating projects. Thank you, David. Uh, and thanks to all of the panelists for their contributions today. Next, I will turn it over to the discussant, Anna Unger, for up to 15 minutes of questions, comments, and her general feedback on all the papers in this panel. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and thanks for all the, all the really interesting papers and the presentations as well. And though I I usually say that I identify as a qualitative scholar because I I am so my strength is not 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 quantitative studies but but qualitative issues and and the let's say legal background I really enjoyed and even I understood uh, I would say eighty percent of all the papers with the with the quantitative issues uh, first with. Um, uh, Melissa and uh, her team's paper, I really, really liked it, especially that focus that you explain for the readers uh, why the local and county level matters. Uh, you mentioned in your paper that the U.S. system is highly decentralized. From my European perspective, it's extremely decentralized. It's not simply highly. It's really hard to explain my students why the local and county level is so interesting. We usually compare uh, the 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 state level, one state from with many different countries, and they are really shocked how many basic differences can happen, can occur in the U.S. election compared to, for instance, uh, uh, to to Hungary, or even Germany, which is a federal state, and they cannot have such. Uh, uh, they are not allowed, I mean, to have such dif basic differences. So this kind of country level approach is really interesting, I guess. And uh, also when I started to read the paper, I had the fear that, uh, oh my God, once again, a new index. Uh, we live in the time of indexes. Everyone wants to, in to, to invent a new index. And some of them are usually a kind of, you know, this kind of data for data sake. Index that we have a new data, but we have we it's not clear wh why uh, why it is necessary to have a new data. And I really like your data set and your your index because it provides an opportunity to compare the U.S. level uh, by county by county, not only state by state, but county by county. Uh, so it's it, 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 I I think it it is important and also. Maybe it would be, I mean, for the reader's perspective, uh, it would be interesting or it would be a little bit more informative to explain the other indices or to compare them, how many and and what is the novelty of your index uh, beyond the fact that the county level matters really much uh, in, in in the American elections. Maybe I would add some examples like, you know, not not like like kind of uh, of of case studies or examples that this happens within the same state in one country or another. You mentioned problems that that may vary, or you mentioned issues that may vary. 
county by county, registration, funding, whatever, but maybe with some real life examples, it would be more obvious or more understandable, more consumable for the reader why it matters that much. And also it would all already highlight the, the relevance and the importance of that index that you test um, uh, in the example of two states, but it would show through the examples uh, the real relevance of the U at the US uh, level as well. Um, and though I said that I'm not a, a, a quantitative scholar, uh, one thing that I missed a bit from the from the index itself, uh, and I really liked the argument that the cost of the, what you really focus on is the cost of the voting. What from the perspective of the of the voter, but one uh, maybe. Maybe I'm wrong and maybe you cannot even measure it. But maybe I would insert one more question to the voter, but what does he feels or she feels as a cost of his or her votes? Because it can happen that uh, we have two, two um, let's say two individuals from the, the, from the very same county, but based on their socioeconomic background, with their social and economic background, for one, that relative high difficulty to reach the driving license office to get the voter ID, it's not a big deal because, because he has the car and he has the car and he can drive easily. And maybe for another, it's a big deal because she has no car and she has to take the bus, the public transport, which exists or not in, the, in that part of the US. And, Maybe that to, to just to put one more thing that, okay, what is the personal um, sense of cost for casting my vote could show the differences between the, if you live here with this background, this is what you feel if you live there with, with that background, it could, it could also me, uh, show something because uh, all the variables you you use in the in index are for electoral management issues and participation and legal and voting rights. It's okay, but I would probably wonder what is the personal uh, personal feeling or or impression of the voter herself. And here I would like to just mention uh, uh, we had a very interesting paper a couple of days ago about the voter satisfaction. It was also kind of index, for also from the US. And the, the how to measure voter satisfaction and maybe beyond the fact that you can compare and you can provide a very detailed index of the inequalities among the many uh, US counties. It can be maybe in the next step. It can be. It could be also interesting to merge this indice or to put this indice into the results of the voter satisfaction because maybe because you know when you you want to measure satisfaction and the cost of index, it's always a bit. It cannot be how to say neutral. It cannot be absolutely objective. It may have some some kind of 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 subjective part or or. Or, or a kind of bias part. And it's always interesting when I have students from the US and also from Europe, they can argue a lot for uh, self-registration, you know, for, for pros and cons. And it is really interesting that a lot of, a lot of issues in the Amer American uh, voting rights that is almost outrageous and, and causes high scandals when we discuss, I mean, among um, Europeans, it's absolutely okay for the for the uh, Americans and vice versa. And maybe this would be interesting to to check whether the satisfaction with these rules and my personal assumptions about the rules, how um, how do they affect the outcome? But otherwise, I think that the novelty is absolutely clear of the of the index, and I I would be really surprised if you couldn't publish this this uh, paper right now when you have so much, yeah, so much, I, to say the least, so much expectations and, and around the, the coming election. So everyone focuses on that election. And I think that the, 
the van on Republican democratic divides and the, the different lawmakings and the outcomes of the different procedure uh, are in the center of the of the debate. So probably your paper could be could be a very important and I'm sure it is a very important paper because it gives a tool for the American people, also the experts, to measure the inequalities. And I don't think I have to explain, uh, you don't have to explain why inequality matters in this way. So I just wanted to say thank you. And I really hope that we will read it in, in a published version soon. Okay. Uh, then the second is Rougier and Staffan's paper about leadership transition, which I also really like because my idea is that, uh, of course, institutions and procedures matters, but the person personal aspect is also important and uh, uh, right now we are in Hungary we are just uh, right after a third recount of the Lord Mayor election elections of Budapest the capital of Hungary and the personal expertise and the personal background mattered a lot but uh, if we had paid if we had people, who who know what their job is, what their responsibility is. Uh, for just a couple of hints, uh, what was not clear from the presentation and the paper either, that uh, when you mean leadership, you mean the top, the national top, or this paper also refers to the local or regional levels. Because for instance, in Hungary, we have a three level uh, system, the local, the county level, and the national level. But I guess it varies uh, state by state, country by country. But the paper is not clear about the the meaning of leadership or executive. What do you mean under this the local or all? It can happen that it's okay if you mean all the leaders, the executives of the of the many several different level electoral man, uh, management bodies but it should be i guess maybe it's better if you if you uh, make it concrete in the text that you will focus only on the top the national or you refer to all the possible executives of the emb's um and uh, one more thing maybe two is that uh, I had the feeling, I had the impression when I, I was reading your paper that for me it was a bit kind of, I wouldn't say naive, but I would say too objective towards the political side. That the politics and the politicians take it for granted. So I had the assumption that the paper assumes that politicians and politics are not really interested in this issue they let the the autonomy of the system regardless of the system whether it's a single led or three members or multi whatever but politicians are not interested in this topic and they have no say in this topic however the reality is that whatever transition system we have it must be regulated and it's the lawmakers who regulate it so if it's the politicians who regulate it and I really, I, 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 I think it, it could be an interesting part beyond the description, beyond the, 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 the explanation of the different systems that where, what is the point or where are those points where politicians and politics can appear, can have a dis decisive point or can have an influence because EMBs are not, on political institutions, they are always they are always results of political decisions, even if they are covered by expertise or bureaucratic uh, tendencies. Whatever politics is behind uh, the, the 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 instruments and the institutions, and maybe it would be interesting to highlight this. Also, even in that case, if the transition is not regulated whose interest is not to regulate such transitions, for instance, whose interest to have a chaos and why? Why it is, who, 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 who are the beneficiaries? Who are the, the, what are the pros behind such institutions and how can we prevent 
these these situations if we want to. Maybe um, this is what I, I really miss and I really like the comparison really it was it it, it was it was really an uh, uh, interesting. A chart where you compare the Indian elections with the remaining, so-called remaining countries, it is shocking to see how many people uh, for for how many days have to vote, and we are not, and we we add the other countries, uh, and also in this respect, it was a bit interesting how the Indian elections were undermined in the international news for weeks, though the stakes were were quite high. And how other countries' elections were a bit over over covered, or I don't know, uh, highlighted. Though the 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 relative scale of of uh, electorate or the relative scale or relevance of the elections were a bit less. Uh, okay, and one more thing uh, for this transition issue is to. Maybe it could be also interesting to add the state's own regulations about bureaucratic, bureaucratic institutions and transitions or other uh, important constitutional institutions like courts um, or, or auditory uh, courts of auditors or whatever, whether they have a transition procedure and rules or not. Uh, Okay, and finally, David, uh, the, the 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 lecturer reform and turn out the consequence and the the, the correlations. I, I, though you seemed a bit disappointed with the results, but I'm happy with it in that sense that I I, I never like uh, arguments that think that things are, especially in actions and voting, are monocultural in that sense that if we change one thing, it will change everything. And the, the expectations toward voter turnout is always like, okay, if we ease the, the registration or if we ease the, uh, the casting of votes, then the turnout will rise. And I, I honestly, I'm happy that your paper has the result that no, the case is not that easy. That's not simply, there are no simplistic uh, um, correlations between or simplistic uh, consequences between these two facts. What is uh, this? This may sound uh, minor uh, comments, but I don't think they are not. I really like that you collected, you did a, a literature review about the reform, electoral reform. However, I have a real problem with this word, maybe because I'm from Hungary and we are we, we live in a constant constant electoral reform, though they are not reform in that sense, that when we say reform, we tend to think that something is not really good and we want to repair it. There is a kind of suggestion behind this word reform, that we we not simply modify something, but we make it better. And in case of elections, just making Changes just modify something. It's not easily, or it's not necessarily leads to reform in that sense that it is, it it makes it better or it will be a, an easier access. So maybe I would somehow highlight this issue that not every electoral modification is a reform in that sense that it will it will help or it will ease and uh, anything. And also. Uh, the role of lawmakers as politicians who are politicians who are not experts is not really explained in the paper, I guess. So maybe it would add an extra value to the paper if you mentioned the, the intentions behind the lawmakers' actions. Why do they introduce such bills? Why do they want to, to reach such reforms? Why do they promote such... Uh, um, modifications in electoral law because it's usually it's not for I would say it's not kind of you know um, non uh, I would say it's not a, uh, a non uh, selfish issue they are selfish politicians who who wants to get something uh, in a, uh, in exchange for these reforms 
And also maybe it would be interesting because you you do this analysis and you you have the conclusion that okay, just simply changing the registration or easing the registration for the people won't raise the 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 turnout. However, it would be also interesting if you add, if you do the case study of these 12 countries, if you also summarize the other factors that may affect, that may have an impact on turnout, I would say public health, public safety, public security, for instance. If we had elections during COVID, probably we couldn't leave our home so easily, or whether uh, voting from abroad is an option or not, especially in those countries where thousands of, of people left the, uh, were forced to leave the country or left the country because of asylum issues, because of wars, because of security or or health or, or hunger or whatever. So what are the, the extra factors or the time of the, of the elections? If we had elections during summertime in Hungary, I guess, less than 50% 50, 50 of the electorate would come. Or if you have two days long election period, it may raise or it not. So there are other factors that may affect the turnout and you mentioned them in the paper, but you not, maybe it would add an extra value of the paper if you analyze them in detail country by country, or if you focus on those countries and analyze that what could have been the other factors that affected the decreasing or not increasing of the turnout because it would add an extra argument, an extra explanation beyond the fact that you tested the hypothesis and it turned out that uh, easing the, the registration isn't lead to, it doesn't lead to, to higher turnout. How, otherwise, I, I really like the paper and I do hope also in your case and Raj's case that you can publish it soon and and I can give it to my student for literature. Thank you very much.